Uh, if you're just joining us, please find a space at a table. If, if there's, uh, because this workshop, this is a team activity, so it is best done in larger groups. I can see there's a table of three people over there that can, you can join. Um, the tables are set up for five or six people. There's materials on the table for six people. So you can also grab a chair from the back of the room and use it to join one of the tables of six. Uh, it is to, oh, wow, there's something about standing right here where I'm getting a lot of feedback. I don't know what's picking it up, but I guess I'll try not to stand right there. Um, come on in and grab a seat. We are just getting underway. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Ellen Grove. I am an Agile coach. I'm from Ottawa, Canada. I'm also one of the organizers of Agile India. So in, in fact, today is today's the day my theme team put together. So uh, completely aside from my workshop, let me know what you think of how today is going, what, how the conference is going so far. Um, but uh, what we're here to do today is we're here to talk about team working agreements. Everything is awesome when you're part of a team, except when it isn't. And we've probably all been on that team, right? It's a really, it's a really special thing to be part of a high-performing team where people are working together effectively, where we're getting stuff done, where we're having fun doing it, and we know how to work together, and we know how to get through the rough stuff together. But it's not something that just happens. It's not ha something that just happens if you throw people together in a box and say, you, you guys there, you go be a team now, right? There's a lot of stuff that we need to figure out about how do we work together? How do we get things going? How do we design a working relationship amongst ourselves so that we can be effective, so that we can help each other, so that we can communicate well together to do whatever the thing is that we're doing. So yes, so this is the name of the talk. Everything is better when we stick together and it's about building team working agreements. We are literally going to be building team working agreements because what we're gonna be doing in this workshop is we're gonna be exploring building team working agreements using Lego Serious Play. So this is not, if you're looking for a place to come and sit back and have a nap after lunch, this is the wrong room to be in. I would invite you, if, if that's what you were looking for, now is a really good time to uh, get up and move along. I'm hoping you'll stay because this is gonna be a lot of fun. The other reason that I think that working agreements are really, really important, and we talked about this a little bit, Naresh kind of touched on this in his keynote this morning, is really effective teams have a lot of diversity, of experience, of thought, different people coming from, you know, different genders, different experience, different different power levels possibly and levels of influence in the organization. We don't want teams where everybody thinks alike. Because when everybody thinks alike, we actually have no original ideas. We don't do new and daring stuff. So when we're putting teams together, we intentionally want a mix of personalities, a mix of approaches. And we one of the things that we have to help teams do is figure out how are they going to resolve all those differences amongst themselves. How are they going to figure out what they have in common and grow those things and how to exploit those differences to their advantage? Because you absolutely do want to have differences on your team. Otherwise, you get into this boring groupthink situation where consensus is really easy, decisions are really easy, because nobody is bringing any new and controversial ideas to the table. You need to have that friction in order for great stuff to happen. So, one of the ways, when I talked about that working agreements are a way that you can design the working relationship in your team. In, uh, professional coaches talking about designing the alliance between the coach and the client about how they're gonna work together. A working agreement and maybe a discussion of the simple gui guiding principles the team is going to follow is the team designing the alliance with themselves about how they're gonna work together. And you want to do this because you want to encourage diversity in thinking, but still have harmony in behavior. We're all gonna be, bring our different ideas and our different experience to the table, but we're gonna behave in such a way that we can make use of those differences rather than having them get in the way. Um, having, designing a team working agreement is a really good way to help the individuals on the team become a little more conscious, a little more reflective of their own behavior and how they fit in, in the team and can help inspire them and encourage them to 
focus on being a better team player rather than just focusing on me, I'm doing my thing and it doesn't matter if you're doing your thing, right? Um, having good working agreements can help team members hold each other accountable as well. Because when the going gets rough, I've uh, probably most of you have been on the team where you feel like three or four people are doing all the work and then there's that one guy over there. There's Chris over there who never really seems to get anything done. He's always late with his work. He's always, you know, he's not doing his share, but nobody wants to talk to him about it. So let's have a conversation before we start working together about what we want to do when we get in that situation because then we'll all feel a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more empowered to go and have that conversation and say, Chris, we got to talk. And I'm picking on you because you're sitting right up front. But, uh, you know, we, we want to put those agreements in place because it's a lot easier to do it before you need to have them. Uh, and, and it just it fundamentally enhances group process by being very explicit about this is how we are going to work together as a group of people. Everybody understands what's on the table. And you can, you know, it, does it eliminate all the friction? No, but it help, will help reduce some of the friction. And you spend a little bit of time doing this up front, you spend a lot less time sorting it out in retrospective after the fact. So the kinds of things that you might do to create alignment amongst your team members, there's sort of two levels of, of agreements that you might want to reach. The first are simple guiding principles, which are the higher level principles that the team uses to guide their behavior in terms of what's important to them. And then working agreements, what I like to think of as working agreements, are very specific behaviors designed to implement those principles. So the simple guiding principles, and you know, Ken Beck mentioned them in Extreme Programming Explained, are things like being present. We want to be present with each other. That can mean a whole bunch of different things, though. The working agreement that might go with be present is uh, you know, no electronics during group discussions because we want people talking to each other, not their phone. Or it could be something like no headphones in the team room. Those are very specific actions that the team members want to hold each other accountable for in order to implement those principles. Um, your team wants to have very few of these. I worked with a team in, in, in the US last year where they were very, very proud of on the wall in their team room, they had a list of 40 items in their working agreements. And uh, as coaches, we were quite impressed. We sort of said, wow, wow, it must have taken you a long time to come up with all of those. And they said, no, it was easy. We just went around and grabbed them all from the other teams and put them together, and there we go. And wow, what a colossal waste of time. Uh, you want to have you want to have focus. What you want to do is use your, the items in your working agreement to really help your team focus on what are the things that are most important to us to be successful and what are the ones that we need to remind ourselves about? What are the things we need to pay attention to? Because if it's something the team is doing already together, we don't need to add that in a working agreement, put it on the wall. We can assume that we've got that one and move on. Where that becomes a little bit tricky though is when you have new team members coming onto the team. That's where some of those things that everybody on the team knows, suddenly everybody on the team doesn't know them anymore. And maybe they have to be part of your working agreements at that point to help new people understand this is how we work around here. So the kinds of things, the other thing about working agreements that I tend to do a little bit differently than some of the other people that I've seen is I see a lot of working agreements which, I mean, they're action oriented, but like they're be at the stand up at nine o'clock or they're, they're very like, they're kind of superficial things. And the kinds of uh, things that you want to capture, really capture in your working agreements, are what are the things that are important to us as team members? What are the things that make us feel good about our work and working with each other? Um, what are the things that we value as individuals in a team and how do we show it in our work and how do we show it in our relationships? How do we want to treat each other? This is the most important thing. How do we want to be together as a team and, and Kind of the most important part about that is what do we want to do when we don't agree? Because high performance teams have lots and lots and lots of disagreements. What makes them a high performing team is they figured out how to get through it together. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking and we're going to start having some fun. And what we're going to do, I mentioned already, we're going to be exploring uh, team agreements through Lego Serious Play. Everybody on their table should have a bag of Lego, 
enough for each person at the table. So if any table has more than six people, you might need to send somebody to the front to grab another bag. Uh, cause I th you also have these little cubes with pictures on them. They're called story cubes. We're going to use them a little bit. Feel free to take a look at them. But everybody should have a bag of Lego. Everybody's Lego has exactly the same stuff in it. And we're going to use this to have a conversation. OK. Is there, do you guys who are sitting along the wall, do you want to grab your chairs and move to that table at the back where nobody can really see from or move that? Set yourselves up so that you can see me and you have a chair and you have some Lego. Take, take a bag of Lego and take three cubes for your table. So just a quick check. How many people in this room have never played with Lego before? OK. How many people have experience with Lego? OK. Take a look. Those of you who haven't played with Lego, no, no. If you have experience with Lego, please keep your hands up for a moment. This is your technical support, OK? If you need help, if you're struggling to figure out how things, Look around for one of those people and ask them for help. What we are going to do first, as a warm-up exercise, I would like you to take the pieces of Lego in your bag, and I would like you to build a bridge. A bridge is anything you want it to be. The only requirement I'm giving you about what a bridge is, you should be able to slide two fingers under the bridge. But apart from that, what your bridge looks like is entirely up to you. The only other thing is every bag of Lego should have a little minifigure in it. I would like your minifigure to appear somewhere on the bridge. Okay? I'm going to give you two minutes to build the bridge. Off you go. Oh, it's all good? Okay. okay. Just under a minute left. No pressure. You see some people are done already. Some people are still perfecting their creations. We're not worried about perfect, though. Okay, so if I can ask you to finish up your masterpiece. Now this is where we probably want to do a little bit of maintenance on the tables because for our building exercises, we're going to want to be able to see everybody's models. So if there are flowers, there are water bottles and things on your table, you might want to push them to one side, kind of clear out the area in the middle so that everybody can see. And what I'd like you to do when you've done that is just kind of move your bridge out in front of you so that everybody at the table 
can see your masterpiece. You can look around and admire what everybody else built. And uh, <laughs> improvising, using the materials at the table to make it even bigger and better, that's very cool. So just take a moment to appreciate the creativity at your table. Because I gave you very simple instructions, a very limited set of materials, a short period of time, but I am going to imagine that no two people built exactly the same bridge. Everybody, even though we started from the same place with the same instructions, everybody brought their own personality, their own ideas to it, and came up with something unique and creative. We are all creative people, right? And one of the things I love about LEGO Serious Play is it helps bring out that creativity in all of us. There are people who go, and we talked a little bit this morning about introverts and extroverts, and people who don't think they're creative, although I don't think creativity is linked to introvertedness or extrovertedness, but I've never seen anybody fail to be creative using LEGO Serious Play. So anybody imagine that the person on their bridge was doing something as you built your bridge and as you put the person on it, you start to make up a little story in your mind about what that person is doing? Good, good, because LEGO Serious Play, it's trying to jump, awesome. I see that a lot, actually. I also see people hanging upside down from the bridge. Then we can have a different conversation about what's going on in your work life. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, this is, but this is what we're going to do. In LEGO Serious Play, what we do is we use LEGO to tell stories, to share ideas with each other about things that are going on. And things that are actually big, serious ideas. This is what, it's LEGO Serious Play for a reason. It's playful, it's fun, but we use this as a technique to talk about some pretty major stuff. Um, my favorite case study, this was not something I did personally, but uh, one of the inventors of LEGO Serious Play, Robert Rasmussen, did some work with NASA after one of the space shuttle explosions. They were trying to pull a team of experts together to create sort of a, a, a committee to figure out, oh my god, what went wrong and how do we not have this happen again? And this was after you know many lives were lost and many years of work were undone. This was a serious thing where a lot of people had a lot of strong feelings and strong emotions. And Robert went in and did Lego Serious Play with that group of people to help them get focused on, let's talk about some of the things that we're feeling as a result of this huge tragedy, and also let's create our vision for moving forward. Let's create our vision for how we want to work together as a group of people who have just been through this really horrible experience. I can't think of a more sort of serious example than that of, of how you might use this technique. People sometimes look at it and go, oh, these silly little Lego blocks. That's fine for you know six guys in the garage at the startup or whatever. But this is a technique that's used in a lot of really difficult situations to help unblock conversations, to help stimulate creativity, to help People come up with ideas they didn't know they had and literally get them on the table so that they can share with other people. So we're going to do another little creative warm-up exercise before we get into building working agreements. And what I would like you to do for the next exercise is take apart your bridge. You can take a picture of your bridge if you like, but you're going to build better stuff later. Um, take apart your bridge, and I'd like you to take some interesting pieces from the blocks that you have. Maybe use 20, 25 pieces. Use all of them if you're that kind of person. I just want you to take a couple minutes and build something interesting. But I want you to think about what that thing is. Come up with an idea of what you're building. Build something interesting. Build something that means something to you. Build something that you've got a little bit of a story about in your head. Okay? I'm going to give you about two and a half minutes to do that build. You're looking puzzled. Do you have, do you have a question about that or are you just daunted by the challenge? Okay. And I apologize. I'm totally going to pick on you for the rest of the presentation, Chris, because awesome. Thank you.
Okay, it's going to give you about 30 seconds more to build. Okay, if you can finish up your creation, and again, move it out a little bit so that everybody at your table can see the magnificent thing that you've built. And I hope you've all got a story in mind about what it was that you built. Okay. Because what we're going to do now is this is where I mess with your heads and do a little bit, make you do a little bit more work. What we want to do before we move into talking about working agreements is we want to warm up our storytelling muscles a little bit. So I ask you to think of the story about the model that you've built. What I'm asking you to do now is you're going to tell a story about your model, but it's not the story you've already got in your head. On each table, there's a little set of story cubes. These are little dice, and they have different pictures on each side. And these are one of my favorite tools for doing sort of creativity thinking with people. What I'm asking you to do is, rather than telling the story that's in your head about your model, you're going to roll the story cubes. There's going to be three images that come up. And you're going to pick one of those images and tell a story about how your model is about, I don't know, I've got this giant eye on mine. So maybe I thought I built a model about, this is my house. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how my model is about how I see the world. Or maybe I'm going to tell you, a story about how my model is about friendship based on whatever picture I choose, okay? So the way this is going to work is the first one person at the table will roll the dice, pick an image, tell the story about their model. And it's just got to be a short story. This isn't like a novel. This is a, you know, six-word story in a tweet will do. Um, but some, you're going to tell a story about your model that's about one of the ideas on the dice. And then you're going to hand the dice to the next person. They're going to have their turn. They're going to have their turn, and you're going to go around the table. I'm going to give you about four minutes to go around the table. OK? Off you go. You roll all three dice, you pick whichever idea appeals to you most, and you tell a story about your model that relates to whatever the idea is. So you got to tell it about your model. If you uh, grab a bag of dice, you probably going to grab the bag of white dice. You're probably going to these tables for him and I. Or you can. We were looking for blue pictures. Yeah. Okay. This is just a little warm-up exercise to get our storytelling muscles going. And the other concept that I want to introduce with this, with the LEGO Serious Play, is when we're building in LEGO Serious Play, we're trying to harness the power of creating metaphor. We're not necessarily trying to build a literal representation of this is the answer to my question. You ask me a question about how my team works, and this is my team, and this is me, and this is where my boss's desk is. We want to build the idea that's in our head about 
the nature of the relationship or about the opportunity. So your model can actually kind of mean anything. It's the story about it that you tell that is really the exciting and the interesting part. And what we've done just in this very, in this warm up exercise, is I've shown you all the steps in the Lego serious play process. It's like all good things, it's actually very, very simple. The way it works is as a facilitator, I present a challenge to you, I ask you to build something. You build a model and you attribute meeting the model. You share your story about the model with the other people at the table so that you can hear everybody's perspective about the question. This is one of the, another one of the reasons that this is such a powerful tool, because it helps level the playing field for the conversation at the table. We've all been in that meeting where one person at the table or two people at the table do all of the talking and everybody else does listen, because either they, you know, they have to think for a little bit before they offer their contribution to the conversation, or maybe last time they offered an idea in a meeting, somebody else said, well, that's a stupid idea to which you go, okay, well then I'm not gonna offer any more ideas, that's fine, right? And that's a tremendous waste. We hire people for their expertise and their creativity, and then what we wanna do is set up situations where we can encourage them to contribute as much as possible. The way Lego Serious Play is structured, where everybody builds, everybody tells their story, is designed to help get input on an equal playing field from everybody at the table. And the whole process of having the build cycle before you tell your story can really help as well. Because there are some people who are just the kind of people who don't talk a lot in meetings, people who are more introverted or people who just you know don't do that. And if you ask them a question in a meeting, they'll give you a two-word answer. If you ask them to build a model and then explain the model, you'll get, oh, and this and this and this, and then there's this part and there's this part of this idea too. And it's just, it's, it's amazing to see them blossom and to see all that creativity come pouring out. So this is how we use LEGO Serious Play. In this workshop, we're just going to do individual builds. We're gonna bring our individual perspective to the table. If we had more time, if we were trying to solve a bigger problem together, we, there'd be another step where we might First build our individual perspective on the situation and then put our pieces together on the table to create a shared model. And that can be really powerful if you're trying to create a shared vision, a shared understanding of something. That actual physical act of taking everybody's point of view and physically making it fit together and figure out, figuring out where things are the same and things are different and how they relate to each other, super powerful. Unfortunately, in 90 minutes, we're not going to get there today. Um, just before we get into the working agreement questions, just a couple of things about how this works that I want to stress. As I mentioned, the way it works is very, very simple. I, as a facilitator, ask a question. What you build is your answer to the question. There are no wrong answers. Whatever, whatever comes out on the table, that's awesome. That's what we want to see. Um, I encourage you to think with your hands, because there are some things that you might go, how am I supposed to answer that in Lego? If Start to play with the blocks. If you start to play with the blocks, you start to pick up pieces, something will come to mind. You'll go, oh, oh, this makes me think of this, and you're off. I have honestly, I have never seen anybody come up dry in a Lego serious play session. I actually, I take that back. When I did this at a conference recently, last year in Scotland, there were a couple of questions that were really similar. We were doing something about conflict resolution. And the first question, somebody at the table, he was like, I don't even know how to answer that question. But then when the second question came around, which was kind of coming at it from a different angle, he was like, oh, yeah. Except for that exception, I've never seen somebody fail to build something because they couldn't figure out what to build. When you're sharing your stories about your models, what I would like you to do is I would like you to listen with your ears, but I would also like you to listen with your eyes. I encourage you to ask questions about the model. If somebody, if Chris is sharing his story of the model, it's perfectly okay to say, hey, you didn't talk about that. Does that mean something special? Those kind of questions are encouraged. The kind of questions I would not want you to ask, because it kind of defeats the point of the conversation, is don't go, oh yeah, I had that happen to me, you know, in response to the story, I had that happen to me two once, did you try this, did you try that? That is not the place for this conversation. What we're trying to do is get everybody's ideas out on the table so that everybody can share them. So clarifying questions are great. Going off into rat holes about the detail of their experience and your experience and how that all fits together 
that's a different part of the conversation. So please resist the temptation to do that. Um, and the last rule of LEGO Series Play is everybody participates. Everybody builds, everybody talks. There aren't any spectators in this room right at the moment, which is cool, because usually I don't allow spectators. Either you're building or you're not in the conversation. In a workshop, not such a big deal. But if you're doing this in your workplace to actually have a real discussion, everybody needs to participate. So getting on to the kinds of things, the questions that we would want to have with the team, the conversation we'd want to have with the team as we're putting together this team working agreement. The first question that I would like you to build is I would like you to build a model that represents either the best or the worst team member you have ever worked with. Your choice, best or worst, but I'd like you to build a model that talks about the best or the worst team member you have ever worked with. Hopefully it's not somebody sitting at your table. Okay? I'm going to give you about three minutes. Off you go. And uh, I'd like you to share the story of your best or worst coworker. What I find works well to help time box things in this situation is if somebody at the table can run a timer for the group, and probably about five minutes is the right size for these groups, for everybody to be able to share their story, because we want to get to the essence of the story. So if you can run a timer at your table for five minutes, and then within the group, you need to share that five minutes amongst yourselves to tell your story, That'll be good. So let's turn with the next question. Uh, maybe the projector will come back on eventually. But this question is about you. The question you're going to build this time is, what is the superpower that you bring to your team? Pretend for a moment that the people you're sitting with, you've just been brought together to work on something big and exciting. We're getting to know each other as part of a liftoff. And what I'm asking you to build is, what is the superpower that you bring to this team that may not be obvious when people first meet you. Okay, I'm gonna give you about three minutes. Off you go. In the space of very little time, are you starting to get to know each other? Starting to learn, yeah, starting to learn things about each other that might not have come out in casual conversation, right? So, now that we've talked about the strengths that we bring to the table, you might want to take a moment and line up your you know, X-Men team, take a little photo, show uh, the powerful team that you have assembled at your table. I'd like to flip the question around a little bit and talk about what kind of help from your team do you need? Because this, again, is one of the signs of a high-performing team where people ask each other for help and offer help all the time. They're not afraid to show up and say, hey, I don't know how to do this. I'm kind of stuck. Could somebody please help me? On teams that are not functioning so well, people are afraid to do that, right? Because we're all hired to be professionals because of our skills, because of what we bring to the team. And it's really hard to drop that and go, hey, I, I can't do this alone. Please help me. I think it really helps at the outset if we talk about what are the kinds of help that I would like from my teammates. And that's what I'm asking you to build this time around. What kind of help would you like from your team? Here, new teammates. What are the kinds of help that you would like from them in order to be the most successful team player you can be? Off you go. We'll give you about five minutes to do the round of storytelling.
somebody going to talk? Okay. It's really important that everybody gets a chance to share their story. And I always feel bad at conferences. It's like, we got to get going, but I don't want to cut off the last person at the table. Um, so you learned a little bit more about your team members now. About We've learned about what are the strengths they have, the superpowers they're bringing to the table, and what kind of help they might need. And that's something that we often don't talk about up front when we come together as a team. How best can we help each other? Think about how much you can accelerate team development by having these conversations up front. Another question that you might ask, I got this from a friend of mine at Agile 2015 last year, and I think this is an awesome question. We will not be building it today, though, because we're only going to do one more build in the time we have, is if I appear to you to be stressed or overwhelmed, I would appreciate it if you do what? Because we all respond to being under stress in different ways. Some people really want the support of their colleagues. They want to go, hey, let's go have a coffee. We can talk about what's bugging you. How can I help you? Other people want, if they're under stress, and I'm kind of one of these people, it's like, no, 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 just leave me alone. Let me sort it out. I'll ask you if I need help. And it's probably a really good thing if you're trying to gel as a team to understand how your teammates approach this situation. Because if you're the kind of person who thinks, oh, when the going gets tough, I absolutely want to have somebody sit down and talk with me and help me through it. And you're offering that kind of help to somebody who's going, no, get away from me. I just want to be alone to figure this out for myself. There will be friction, right? So knowing that about people up front can be super, super helpful. The last build that we're going to do in our session today together, and I think this is really, this is one of the most important things to address in your team working agreement, is the question of, what do we do if somebody on the team isn't doing what I, what we think they should be doing? I picked on Chris. I'll continue to pick on Chris. What if we think that Chris is not pulling his weight on the team? How do we want to handle it? So what I'd like you to do for our final build of this session is that's your question. If somebody, what should we do as a team if somebody on the team, if we feel like they're letting us down? How do we want to handle it? Three minutes to build. What should we do as a team if somebody on the team is letting us down? Go.
you guys hurry away? Or? Okay. Yeah. okay. You guys are fast. Awesome. Has everybody had a chance to share their stories, or does you guys need more time? Okay, we'll give it a minute more. Have you guys had time now? To, you just finished? Okay, perfect. Excellent. So if I can ask you to bring your focus back to the middle of the room, please. I, I mean, from the buzz, from the energy in the room, it's clear that you guys have had some pretty interesting conversations about, about what's going on. You've learned about what are the, yeah, what, what are the things that other people look for in their team members? What are the superpowers that the people who are at, on your team bring to the team that they might not reveal to you? Uh, we've talked about what kind of help we want from our teammates, which is really, really important. And then what do we want to do if things aren't working out? We've started to consider those questions. If we don't think things are working out as they should, how do we want to handle it? And we start to get insights from everybody about how to do it. This is the point at which, and we're not going to build this today because we're getting pretty close to being out of time, but this is the point at which I would sit down with the team and actually have a conversation about, okay, what behaviors do you want to put in your working agreement? Now that you've had a chance to talk to each other a little bit about what your strengths are, what your concerns are, how you would like help from your teammates, let's start to 
figure out what are the rules, what are the guidelines, what are the actions, the behaviors that we want to put in our working agreement that we want to focus that on as a team. You could use Lego Serious Play to do this. You could have everybody build what do you think is the most important thing to put in our working agreement. Um, ideally, you want to have maybe five, not more than seven. So if you have a team of seven people, you could ask everybody to suggest one. If you have a larger team than that, you could ask everybody to build what do they think is most important and then dot vote on them. There's all kinds of different ways to do it. But you want people to really be thinking about what are the hard things we need to do in order to figure out how to work together. Because those are the things that you want to put in a working agreement. Not the easy stuff like, you know, be on time for meetings, although for a lot of teams that's really a struggle and maybe that's the first thing you have in your first working agreement. You know, or, or talk to each other rather than using email, but it's about how do we really help each other? How do we talk to each other when the going gets rough? How can we support each other in being the most effective team members we can, uh, we can be? But what I'd be curious to hear from the room is, what's something surprising that you learned in the course of this exercise? What's something that took you by surprise in the discussions we had together over the Lego? Anybody have something? Were, were you able to build something that expressed trust, though? Oh. Yeah. You, you can use this to convey some really abstract, some really complicated ideas. Because I'm doing this in a workshop setting, we didn't do as much of the warm-up activities as I would do if I was doing sitting down with the team to do this, because we're a little constrained by time. And sometimes that can help with that blockage of, how do I convey this really abstract thing? But people can do it, and it's a really powerful medium for getting to those things. Anybody have anything else they found surprising about this exercise that they wanted to notice? Yeah. Yeah. It's very, yeah. Yeah. very surprising that you can take something as simple as Lego and build these complicated ideas and have these conversations. You had something. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And that's that's one of the critical points actually, is that hopefully this is what's on the next slide, is that the purpose of having the working agreement is that the teams create a shared understanding of how we're working together. And so that takes the the responsibility from that off of the Scrum Master, in the very early days of a team, that's probably somewhere where the Scrum Master is spending more of their energy, is doing that kind of facilitation. But you want to get to the point where the team members are taking on the responsibility for watching how the team is work together, working together and how the behavior of individual team members is affecting the way the team is working and being willing to step up and identify when there are problems that need to be dealt with within the team. Whether there's an individual who is not adhering to the team working agreement, or whether the team as a whole has kind of lost sight of what they said they were going to do together and has sort of gone back to old ways of working. Having that working agreement in place can be a super powerful tool for making that happen more easily. Um, you know, it helps the facilitators, it helps the team members you want to keep this visible. This is something that you should have as a daily reminder of we agreed to be this way. So when I work with teams, ideally their team 
you know, if you have a big physical task force, your team working agreement is somewhere near that big physical task force, and you're looking at it at some point every day. Because the other thing about team working agreements is they are going to change as the team grows and as the team matures. So this is something you want to inspect and adapt periodically along with the work you're doing. Whether you do it as part of your retrospective process or whether you find another way to do it in how you're working together, periodically you want to revisit those working agreements and go, hey, is this what we need to focus on right now? Or are there other challenges that we want to work on in order to get, to get better as a high performing team? And uh, I hope through this experience you've seen how LEGO Serious Play is a super powerful way to do this. Certainly not the only way, but like you said about the amazing conversations people can have with this, this silly little bag of plastic blocks, 43 blocks, we can have some really deep, really uh, important conversations very, very quickly. The LEGO allows you to cut through a lot of the BS that happens at meetings where people want to dance around or that you know they're reciting from the script it makes it when you're building things and you have ideas coming from you know it's pulling up ideas that you may not have realized that you had you're having fun doing it you're getting emotionally engaged although I've had teams actually come to tears over Lego series play but that's a different workshop um, but it provokes a strong emotional reaction too which helps people bring their full selves to the table and you can really get to the heart of the conversation very quickly. So I just before we wrap up, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming out to play with me this afternoon. I really, really appreciate it. What I would like you to do as we leave today is to uh, make sure you pack up your Lego and leave it on the table um, so that we can collect it. I think I got all of the story cubes, that, but if they're there, leave them as well. Please feel, please, when you pack up the Lego, take my business card out of the bag. I would prefer if you take it with you so that if you have any questions about LEGO Serious Play, you know how to get a hold of me. But in any case, take it out of the bag because that's how I know the bag of LEGO has been used. So once again, thank you very much for your time and attention. Yes. You have to find, for the question was, how do you der derive the working agreements for a distributed team? You have to find some technique to have a facilitated conversation where everybody has equal input. Lego serious play is really hard for facilitated teams. It's, I've done it where I've been the facilitator and the whole team has been somewhere else. I haven't done it where the team is scattered around. But you have to find ways of getting Having a conversation where everybody has a chance to have equal input and probably some of the things in your working agreements are going to be specifically about how do we manage those complexities in communication that are caused by being in different locations, in different time zones, in different countries. And you would want to explore those in your working agreements. So I realize that's kind of a general answer, but there is no one, oh, just do it this way because it's going to really depend so much on your team and what's available to you. But thank you. Okay? Thank you.